From Southern California, welcome to the Hour of Power. This week, Pastor Bobby welcomes Dr. Norman Vincent Peale's granddaughter, Katie Berlandi, who is continuing the positive thinking mission of her grandfather. Music by the Hour of Power Woodwind Ensemble and the Hour of Power Choir. And a special message from Pastor Bobby entitled, Sermon on the Mount, Fasting and the Disciplined Life. Discover America's television church as the face and voice of positive Christianity to the world. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. you're having a great day today. You know, we Californians, for those of you watching around the world, are so wimpy. You know, today I woke up and I just thought it was frigid and I got in my car, it was 61 degrees. You know, <laughs> uh, you know and I was thinking like, oh, it's that, you know, all that East Coast weather has made its way to California. And I, you know, we're just so glad you're here today and glad that you braved the terrible fog on your way uh, here to church this morning. Would you turn around to those who are standing next to you, greet them warmly in the name of the Lord and say, God loves you, so do I. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that you've brought us to this place, a congregation of people, all ages, all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of worldviews. Lord, we come here because of Jesus to worship him. He brings us together to celebrate his life in the midst of our differences and our disagreements and all of those things. Nothing is as powerful as the love of Jesus. And so we come here to love him and receive his love. Thank you for your intimacy, God. We adore you and we come here to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. In preparation for this morning's message, please hear and consider the words from Matthew. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you do fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. 
And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. This morning, I really am so happy to be interviewing our guest, Katie Berlandi. Katie is the granddaughter of the late Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who was, of course, not only a pastor, but an... Yeah, we can clap for that. Norman Vincent Peale, of course, uh, was not only a pastor, but an author and a champion of positive thinking. It's amazing to me that I even need to read this, because he's so, such an important uh, figure in American religion. And, and culture even. And his most famous book is, of course, The Power of Positive Thinking, which has sold more than 20 million copies. Katie and I recently met at a guidepost event where I was speaking, and I had the chance to meet a number of people. I met she and her mother, and, and it was just, a, uh, just a, a great event where I was able to sort of get in touch with so many people who are a part of now carrying on Dr. Peel's uh, legacy. And so Katie and I uh, have formed a friendship, and I said, you know, you have to, have to come out to California and let me interview you at, at our church and on the Hour of Power. So we're so glad you're here, Katie. Maybe we can give her another hand and thank her for making this trip. I might just want to say, too, for our new followers, because and we have a lot of them, how huge an impact your grandfather had on my grandfather's life. Um, which also makes this, in a way, interesting. You know, uh, Dr. Peel's granddaughter, doc, Dr. Schuler's grandson. I feel like the big tipping point and breakthrough for our church was when your grandpa came and spoke at our drive-in movie church <laughs> years ago. This, this guy, no, you know, not a lot of people had heard of outside of the country and, and outside of the state, and, uh, but everybody knew who Dr. Peel was. And uh, your grandfather came and preached, and it, and it was the thing that sort of caused our church to explode. And yeah. I remember Grandpa, if I may, sure. saying um, how clear it was within moments mm -hmm. that uh, your grandfather was going to do uh, 
tremendous things, yeah. and um, he certainly uh, did and still does. And so uh, Grandpa and Grandma both were very happy to be as supportive as possible to those, that endeavor. And of course, my, my grand, you know, your grandfather was a pastor, and what he did for my grandpa personally can't even be measured, let alone not just the mentoring, but just the book. You know, he, my granddad grew up in this very strict Dutch Calvinist, like, God hates you, and you're barely, you know, he just can't wait to put you into hell, but, you know, if you're perfect, maybe you'll barely escape. And then here comes Norman Vincent Peale that just talks about God's love and that we serve a positive God. And it just, the timing for my grandfather, I think it just changed his life radically. Right. Well, I know my grandfather was humbled by, by any of that influence. But, and they were great friends, mm -hmm. they too. Were. Um, and that, that's an important element as well. And here's a question I know you've been asked a lot because I've been asked a ton. What's it like growing up being Norman Vincent Peale's granddaughter? Um, well, it was pretty terrific, I, I might say. I would, I would begin by saying that um, uh, Grandma and Grandpa's ministry um, and their world travel and their relationships with world leaders and all of that was not um, at the forefront when we were together as a family. And my siblings and I grew up um, in a town where my grandparents had a country home. Mm -hmm. So whenever they weren't traveling, they were near to us. And that allowed us a lot of um, very natural, authentic time together. Um, you know, I, as we all think back on our, our time growing up with grandparents, um, over time, that, that aperture of that lens opens up as we learn more about them. And um, it has been a remarkable experience for me over my lifetime to learn about the impact and the influence both grandma and grandpa have had on lives. And, um, and I say that um, with a, a lot of humility because I know that they felt that too. Any way they could be helpful one person at a time yeah. was, was a, a, a gift from, from God to, to them. As well, and, so. and what kind of impact do you see? What do you think is the biggest impact that your grandparents um, have had? I, you know, it, that's, a, that's a powerful question. And, um, you know, my grandfather was a remarkable speaker, and he spoke without notes. And he was quick-witted and, uh, and um, was filled with humility and uh, emotion. And so I'm, I'm ask, asking him to channel through me right now as these <laughs> questions are asked with no notes, but um, um, I, would, I would say that their, their greatest influence would be letting people know that they are loved, mm -hmm. and they are loved by God, and they um, must love themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and through that, uh, a, a full, full life can be had. And what's amazing, too, and I think what you said is exactly true, what's amazing is that before your grandfather started saying that, not very many people were saying that in the church in the 40s, 50s, and even 60s. He's really the one that brought, I think, in many ways, the church back to which is such a fundamental thing in the Bible, which is God's love for people, for sinners. And not in a way that, like, God barely loves you, but God kind of loves you as you are. I mean, I, I, I think that there are so many pastors today that if you trace their doctrinal heritage, it goes back to your grandfather. Yeah. And I, I, I without, without a doubt, and, and I think Grandpa would never consider himself a, an academic, mm -hmm. though I think he was more so than he, than he ever deemed himself to be. But um, also, I think just the whole idea of um, inspirational thinking or positive thinking being a, a spiritual act, just in the way in your book, Bobby, you speak, speak about um, gratitude mm -hmm. being a, a spiritual act. And mm -hmm. I think um, that, again, is a, is a gift from, from God as well. Great. And how did you get involved with Guideposts? Of course, that's his sort of big legacy now that right. carries on. It's still an active ministry, which you're involved with. Absolutely. And um, I'm a, a clinical social worker by training. Um, and so I, without a doubt, was influenced um, that direction by the work of grandma and grandpa mm -hmm. and the care for people. And um, I've always wanted to somehow be able to circle back to have some involvement or perhaps some impact um, uh, on grandma and grandpa's ministry. So I've been working with Guideposts, uh, Guidepost magazine, um, 
and also Guidepost Foundation, which is a, a wonderful foundation that's supported by Guidepost um, friends and, and supporters, uh, donors, um, and we have three outreach divisions. One is in pediatrics, mm -hmm. and one is with the military, where we provide military with all, uh, inspirational material all over the world and for their families as well. And then Our Prayer, which is a 24-7 um, prayer opportunity. So I help with that, and I write a blog on their website. Okay. And, um, and so I'm, I'm really honored, and it has opened my eyes even more to the impact of, of, of their, their legacy. Obviously, Dr. Peel's message is so important to you. Um, I mean, you, you have a dream for the future of his message. What do you hope to see happen with his legacy? Well, I mean, I feel, as so many people um, perhaps do, that his message and Grandma's message, too, because they were a team, there yeah. was no doubt about that, yeah, um, right. is a timeless one, um, one of inspiration and, and positive thinking. And so there's no time like now to be innovative in the way grandma and grandpa were innovative with starting guideposts and um, what they did with Marble Collegiate Church and with uh, the Institutes of Religion and Health and all these things. They were innovative, visionary people. And I think now is a time to uh, use all of grandpa's works, his writings, his speeches, his sermons, um, and our world of technology um, yeah. to get his, his message out there to more and more people to, to enhance lives. Yeah. So I, I see this as a pivotal time to use, our, our world has gotten smaller with technology, which means we can get the word out even more. And there is already a, um, an app on both the Droid and the iPhone, the MVP app, where you can listen to Grandpa's sermons. Oh, so, cool, that's amazing. great. So please do. Awesome, I'll have to check that out, that's great. And of course, I know it's so easy, you know, when you're the granddaughter of a major figure like this to be sort of overshadowed. I imagine that if we could, like, hear Dr. Peel now, you'd say, stop talking about me, Katie has an important message. <laughs> what is her, and what is that? If you were to say, this is my message, this is my heartbeat, what is it that, that you really want the world to hear? Oh, I, I, I think what, what I would say is how I can be used as a tool through my legacy and through who I am to help people understand their value mm -hmm. in this world and have people understand the value of others. And through that, connections are, are formed. And we all know that for our lives to be as full as possible, we need to feel connected to, to others. And so that there is where I would begin, perhaps. Great. Well, we feel connected to you and value you, and we're Thank so you. glad that you've come today. Thank you for sharing your grandfather's Thank you, and I have, one little, I have one little thing for Bobby here, in that um, when my grandfather spoke at the Crystal Cathedral in 1990, uh, it was the last time he spoke there, uh, Dr. Schuler sent him a beautiful picture of the two of them. Oh, great with their hands clasped and uh, <laughs> our arms raised. And the inscription from Dr. Schuler on the back said, to Norman, together we make a great team. Love, Robert Schuler, Garden Grove, California, Sunday, November 25th, 1991. So I, I give this to you and would love to be part of your team oh, in, in any way, you, Bobby. Thank you, Katie. So, That's really a sweet so. gift. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So handsome. I love that. Thank you again, Katie. Let's give her another hand. We love you and appreciate you so much. Thank you. And now, the Hour of Power Woodwind Ensemble.
Thank you, our Power Woodwind Ensemble. We love you guys. And of course, here at this Church of Ministry, we love good music and good musicians. And we only have the best. Well, good morning. We are back in the Sermon on the Mount series. And today we continue uh, that study. John read this morning the passage that we're going to be setting today, and so I just want to say congratulations. You have come to church on the day we're going to talk about fasting. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Thrills. Uh, some of you have probably never fasted before unless it was like some kind of a health thing. Most of us, a lot of us have never fasted or understood what fasting is for the spiritual life. And believe it or not, today I'm not going to spend as much time talking about fasting as much as the idea behind fasting. Jesus says in this passage today, when you fast, do not be, look somber like the hypocrites who disfigure their faces to show men they're fasting. But when you fast, put oil on your head and water on your face so it won't be obvious to other people that you're fasting, but it'll only be obvious to God. Then, you're, then God who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And that's really what I wanna talk about is that last sentence. What is that reward that Jesus is talking about that we get when we practice any spiritual discipline. There really is a major problem when the things that we do, whether it be fasting or helping our neighbor or giving to the poor, charitable needs or prayer or worship or going to church, when we do those things to prove something spiritually to others, but I might even add to even prove something spiritually to ourselves, we have totally missed the point of the gospel. That, that fasting and any other spiritual discipline cannot be about trying to get people to like and accept you more. It cannot even be about you trying to like and accept yourself more because I, I'm fasting or because I'm helping those in need or whatever. We must learn what grace is, and grace means the unmerited favor and love of God, the ferocious, undying love that God has for you, no matter what you do, just as you are. See, that's Christianity. That's Christianity. And so today I want to convince us and convince you that, that fasting is feasting, that when we fast, it is because we are trying to put ourselves in a place of devouring spiritual good, uh, spiritual fruits and spiritual bread, which is Jesus. That when we go to a place of fasting or a place of prayer, it's not for spiritual kudos. It's not to say, look how religious and Christian I am. Uh, it's to eat the goodness of God. Pretty much the whole sermon I'm going to give you today is about God's love. And that's what fasting teaches us. It's all about God's love. Did you know the God that we serve in our theology as Christians is the only God in religious conversation that loves sinners? Every other image of God is constructed in the imagination of mankind. No matter what it is, that God loves me and values me based on what I do. 
And many of these ideas that come from other religions weave their way into Christianity. How many of us think God will love me and accept me more when I overcome this great uh, vice in my life? Only, you know, when that happens, yeah, I know that God loves me, but when I overcome this big vice in my life, now God's really going to love me even more. Or maybe God's going to favor me or bless me or, or listen to my prayers more. That's the same thing. How often do we in Christianity view our own relationship with God based on our own merit? It's almost impossible for us to understand that a three times holy, perfect God actually loves us in our sin, our brokenness, our addictions, our hatred, our venom, our anger. And even then, God loves us, adores us, favors us, blesses us, and hears our prayers. That's Christianity because that's grace. You see, it's so hard because the physical world that we live in and operate in is totally based on merit, isn't it? especially in America, where we have the freedom to achieve and accomplish goals. Those are good things. But the sort of bad side effect of this kind of a world that we live in is that everything is about merit. It begins in school, doesn't it, with grades? When you go to school and you're like in second or third grade and you didn't do very good work, so you got a C or a D, and this guy over here got an A or a B. And as you progress along in school, you start to realize that if I work hard, my merit grows and my parents and my school accepts me in a a better way. And now all of a sudden my future looks better. And so this starts to weave in everything we do. If I work hard and press hard and, and take hold of opportunity, then great things will happen. But the less efficient I am, the less bold I am, the less risk I take, well, then I start to fail. When I mess up, I need to hide that and manage my reputation. See, all of these things about just living life and advancing in your career weave its, its, weaves its sort of ugly side into our faith. Where we start to think that my relationship with God is, is based on merit. You know, like if I, if I can really pray a lot, God's gonna, is going to listen more, bless me more. If I really give a lot more to charity... It, if I overcome my vices, if I, if I do these things, and somehow there's, there's a part of us that says, well, I've come a little bit closer to God's love. But that gets everything backwards. You cannot become a virtuous Jesus kind of person by your own work. It begins and ends with the power that comes from knowing that I'm not what I have, I'm not what I do. I'm not what people say about me. I'm God's child, and he loves me, and that cannot increase and cannot decrease. He loves me, not as I should be, but he loves me just as I am. Your life is not a disappointment to God. He sees all the skeletons in your closet. He knows all of the hidden things of your heart. He knows that one or two things that you haven't told anybody. He knows your past and even knows your future. And you are not a disappointment to God. He loves you. Is proud of the fact that you exist because he made you and crafted you in your mother's womb. He knows you and knows the deepest parts of you and with everything there right now, loves you. And without understanding that, all this other stuff we talk about on the Sermon on the Mount, the way we treat people, the way we try and not be angry and all these things we do, it's a waste of time if we do not understand God's deep, precious, and ferocious love for you, his son or his daughter. I cannot impress that enough on you. Is your life is not a disappointment to God. He's pleased in you and takes great pleasure in your existence and treasures you. Isn't that encouraging? Brendan Manning, who's a great spiritual thinker and author, uh, discovered this in his own life after trying to sort of muscle out a strong spirituality. And he said that in the twilight of his life, As an old guy, after spending, he said, thousands of hours in solitude and prayer, I realize and I believe in my heart that when we die and come to face God on Judgment Day, God will ask us one question. 
and one question alone. He will ask us when we're standing there before him, did you believe that I love you? That's a question about grace. When we're standing there before God, he will simply ask us, did you believe that I love you? And the true believers, the true Christians will say, yes, Lord, I knew you loved me, even in my wretchedness, in my sin, in my brokenness, in my hurting, even in my loathing and in my lack of work and laziness and all of those things, I knew you loved me. But some of us, and sometimes I wonder if even myself, you know, in a large part this is a sermon to Bobby Shuler, I say, what would I say? Because when God can see the depths of my heart and words don't matter because he already knows, he already knows what I did and what I think, can I say, yes, I knew truly my whole life that you loved me. And that was the place from what I did everything in my faith and religion and the way I treated my neighbor. Everything came from knowing that you loved me. See, some of us on that day will say, no, Lord, I, I think I didn't know you loved me. But I think even for those of us who say that, he will say, well, come and know my love now. Because God's love is so grand and so rich and so unending that if you don't know it now, you will know it then. And you'll wish you had carried it with you through life. Because all morality, all goodness, all strength comes from deeply understanding and knowing God's love. Brendan Manning added this one passage, and it's a bit, it's a bit harsh for church, but I, I read it years ago, and it's always stuck with me. And, and, uh, and so I, I, uh, I'd like to read it, and it's a little long, but it, and it, I hope you forgive me if it's offensive. But he says, because salvation is by grace through faith, I believe that among the countless number of people standing in front of the throne and in front of the Lamb, dressed in white robes and holding palms in their hands, I shall see the prostitute from the Kit Kat Ranch in Carson City, Nevada, who tearfully told me that she could find no other employment to support her two-year-old son. I shall see the woman who had an abortion and is haunted by guilt and remorse, but did the best she could to face with grueling alternatives. The businessman besieged with debt who sold his integrity in a series of desperate transactions. The insecure clergyman addicted to being liked who never challenged his people from the pulpit and longed for unconditional love. The sexually abused teen molested by his father and now selling his body on the street who as he falls asleep each night after his last trick whispers the name of an unknown God he learned about in Sunday school. The deathbed convert who for decades had his cake and ate it too and broke every law of God and man, wallowed in lust and raped the earth. But how, we ask? Then the voice says, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. There they are. There we are, the multitude who so wanted to be faithful, who at times got defeated, soiled by life, and bested by trials, wearing the bloodied garments of life's tribulations, but through it all clung to the faith. My friends, if this is not good news to you, you have never understood the gospel of grace. Amen to that. And as a pastor, you know it because you build relationships with people that you thought their lives were perfect and then they pour out their souls to you and you see all of us are broken. All of us are broken. The only perfect person you know is a person you don't know at all. I wrote this down in my journal that God, he sees what you could be. He knows what you should be. But he loves you just as you are. And until we get there, just everything else I'm about to say just doesn't even matter. All holiness, all righteous living, all goodness can only naturally come from a place of intimacy and understanding. God's unending, perfect, meritless love for his kids. I'm so happy about that. Now, the human soul cries out for intimacy. 
The human soul, every part of our soul, cries out for intimacy. We were created this way. We were created from God into a world that was separated in many ways from God. So in our very nature is a desire to be reconnected with God and with people. That's why being lonely is such a horrible feeling because you become acutely aware of your separation from people and you're also deceived that you're acutely aware that you're separated from God. And so when the soul cries out for intimacy, the body cries out for intimacy. We're about to talk about fasting here and how it matters. That the body cries out for intimacy. And when the body cries out for intimacy, the typical American or Westerner does this. Okay, my body cries out for intimacy, so I will give it food. I will give it media. I will give it some shopping. That feels nice. Uh, I will stay busy. I will call a friend. And maybe he can meet my need or she can meet my need. And what happens is when the body cries out for intimacy and we give it food and busyness and shopping and media and all of these things, those good things, which are fine, which are a blessing from God, become a bit warped. They mutate. They become a monster in our lives. Because at first it feels good, but it doesn't last. And so food becomes gluttony. Wine with a friend becomes alcoholism. Media becomes pornography or false romances that you, 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 you think need to be in your life. Shopping becomes greed and indebtedness and busyness becomes unbridled restlessness. And as we do that, the irony, the cycle is that our body even more cries out for intimacy. And so we say, here's more food, here's more media. Here's more busyness and more friends and more stuff and, and, and I'll buy more things. And then we cry out even more for intimacy. This is a broken part of human existence. Our body cries out for intimacy and our bodies need to be conquered with God's love. Your body needs to be conquered with God's love. Did you know God loves your body? Some of you are like, God doesn't love this body. <laughs> God loves your body. Our bodies are super weird, aren't they? In many, many ways, and I won't go into detail how. I mean, I remember though being a kid, you know, you kind of go into adolescence and it's like, oh, my body does this now, all right. <laughs> and then it's like, you know, that, that's a funny question. And then as, as you get older, I'm now getting into, you know, well into my 30s now and I'm starting to ask that question, but now I'm starting to say, oh, my body does this now, <laughs> you know? like. I know many of you are like, I hate you, you know, you have no idea. <laughs> My brother-in-law, who's an optometrist, told me the other day, you know, as I, you know, he said, you know, when you turn 40, you're going to need glasses. And I said, well, not me. I, I, <laughs> My vision's great. I, I, have, I actually have 20-10 vision. My, my father-in-law is also an optometrist. One day I read a sign down the road. He said, you can see that sign? I said, yeah. He said, I said, he said, I want to test your eyes. And I'm one of only four people he's ever tested with 2010 vision. Yeah, it's like a superpower, like a little superpower. <laughs> and so here my brother-in-law, who took after his father, says, when you turn 40, you're going to need glasses. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to. And he's like, well, you're not going to admit it for at least five to ten years. <laughs> but you're going to get them. And you, see, you know, and that's the thing about our, our bodies. A lot of us hate our bodies, you know. Many of us... You know, there's all, it's constantly changing and all sorts of weird things are, are happening to our bodies. And, and so all of us age, you know, I remember one, one, handy, uh, one uh, uh, person with disabilities said, like, you are only temporarily capable. You know, he was saying, like, all of us someday will be handicapped. You're the one that just has a little extra time. And that was a really haunting thought to me, you know, just the idea that, you know, it was weird even, like, I was thinking this week that, like, I know this seems silly, but I'm too old to play professional sports now. And I'm too old to enlist in the military. And like, I would have, I never was planning on enlisting in the military and never am planning on playing professional sports. Just the fact that now I'm too old to do those things just doesn't settle right with me, you know? I don't like that. And, and you see, that's, that even at, at my young age, it's something that all of us, aging and, and other things, sickness, and just the weird things of the body, it's just kind of something that, 
that bothers us. Weird things. All of a sudden, we can't eat certain foods. And many of you, have, you know, all of a sudden, you've got this new bag, or you've got this new wheelchair, or you, you know, you've got this new weird thing that's going on in your body, and you have to take this particular medication, and, and, some, you know, and, and just all sorts of things for us young and old. M- many of us who are very young, I think of like Nick Vujicic, who has no arms and legs, you know, and, and, and that God loves his body. God loves your body. And that the body is an, an important part of, of old school Christian theology. A lot of it's been lost in sort of the new stuff in the last century. But really, you read the old documents from the church and God loves the human body. That's why it's so important to the early Christians that, that this fact is non-negotiable. That Jesus was resurrected from the dead in his real physical body with holes in his hands and in his feet. That's like a non-negotiable Orthodox Christian teaching. In those days, the Gnostics wanted to teach, well, that he, he was raised in spirit because only the spirit mattered. And you can read literally hundreds of documents from the early church that say, no, it's not just the spirit that matters, but the body matters because God loves the body. And the body with all of its aging and sickness and brokenness and white hairs and, and all of that, you know, <laughs> that amidst all of that, God loves your body and chooses to call your body his temple. That matters. If you start to meditate on this week, you'll see how that changes in a big way. Changes your spirituality. God then, so many of the things that we experience in in life, like not just hunger, but but things like lust or anger um, or, or even like the, the compulsive need to buy things, a lot of this really revol- revolves and lives in your body. And it's like you're, at some level your mind has been renewed and your spirit has been renewed, not your body. Like you have like parts of your body that are almost arguing with your mind. I know none of you have said in your mind, I'm not going to eat that chocolate cake, but your body says, yes, you are. <laughs> huh? And please do not think this sermon is about weight loss or anything. What it really is about is simply that saying, those of you that say, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too tall, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too whatever, I'm too hairy. There are some of you that are too hairy, I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> no, but, no, even if you're too hairy, I, in all of the weird ways that you don't like your body, God loves your body and wants to train it and subdue it and conquer it with his love. You see, when we don't understand God's love, our body cries out for intimacy, for all these carnal pleasures. Our body just screams for it. And like a mosquito, like scratching a mosquito bite, when you give it those carnal pleasures, yeah, for a minute it's a little better, but later it wants it even more. And what the body truly wants, it's screaming out for intimacy with God, to know truly God's love. In the Bible, when we talk about the heart in the Bible, many of us think the heart is the emotions. In the Bible, the heart does not mean your emotions. So when it says follow your heart, it does not mean follow your emotions. The heart is your will. In old old school philosophy and in the Bible, the heart means the will. It means what you choose to do. You can't actually directly affect your will. What you want is what you want. But there are other outside factors that can affect your will, like your mind, and like your body, and like your emotions. In the Bible, the emotions, like anger, things like that, live in the stomach, in the belly. And that's why the old school mystics uh, believed in fasting. Fasting was a way in which you could essentially attack the place where your emotions dwell. I know like when I start getting short with Hannah, my wife, and I, I'm a little on edge. She's, she, she very calmly looks at me and puts a hand on my shoulder and she says, I love you. I was like, I love you too, what? <laughs> she says, have you eaten lately? <laughs> I'll say, no, but maybe I will now. <laughs> and uh, you know, there's, many of us are that way, you know, like we, you see like when you're hungry, you tend to, you know, when you're hungry, you tend to kind of hurry more and, and be a little on edge. And, and there's something about fasting then that is a way of controlling your emotions. 
It's a way of moving from a place where I say constantly, I'm going to give in to what my body wants. Like eating, shopping, media, busyness, going out, drinking, whatever. I'm going to just step back from that. And in, in, the, in the midst of my intentional hunger, I'm going to feast on the good things of God. Fasting is a way of training and subduing your body to come in harmony with the love of God. You know, it's one of the three big disciplines that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. The first is giving to charity, the second is prayer, and the third is fasting. Because fasting, probably more than any spiritual discipline, with as difficult as it is, brings your body into harmony with God's love because it teaches you, you know what? I don't need to eat right now. I don't need to give my body what it wants all the time. That's a good thing. It's a good thing because then it helps things like eating and media and all those things go to a healthy place, a place that blesses you. And that's a, that's a good thing. And we want to get there. If you want to fast, this is how you do it, okay? Fasting, uh, make sure you talk to your doctor before you fast because if you're like diabetic or something, you can't fast. You have to give up something else, okay? If you're going to fast, you might want, if you've never done it before, maybe think of fasting a lunch. If you want to fast for a day, I would start after dinner so that you fast one dinner to the next and just drink water for a day. And if you want to go really hardcore and go three days, this is what, I'd, what I have done in the past. You get like a thing of Trader Joe's apple juice. Get like the kind that's kind of like, like not pasteurized and, and good. And do one part's apple juice, two parts water. So you're just drinking a lot of water with just a little bit of apple juice in it. And you go three days. The first day is difficult. The second day is torturous. And the third day is euphoric. And it's like that third day that you kind of, at least for me, you feel like you've sort of conquered it. So if you'd like to do it, go for it. But whatever you do, don't do it to prove anything to yourself. Don't do it to prove anything to anybody else. Do it to subdue your body and train it and teach it that it is loved by God and it doesn't need food. And, and it also then teaches you about other things. Fasting then in a weird way sort of goes to some of the other things in our life too. There might be other things instead of food that you may think that I need to kind of fast from. The main point of this is simply to say that our bodies, all of us, are in a state of brokenness and are out of alignment with the Spirit of God, most of us, which says, I love you. I love you not as you can be or, or will be someday or as you should be. I love you just as you are right now. How many of us on that judgment day will be able to stand before God and say, yeah, Lord, I believed truly with all my heart that you loved me. Many of us won't be able to say that. And God will say, oh, how I wish you knew when you were there. Your life is not a disappointment to God. Your life is not a disappointment to God and it's not a disappointment to me. You are loved and cherished and needed and wanted. Not because of what you do, not because of what you have, not because of what anybody says about you. You are loved and valued. And until we understand this, everything else is a waste of time. Let's pray. Father, so grateful we are for you and asking, Lord, for your power and goodness to be evident in our lives. Many of us, God, are being called into a time of fasting, a time in which we have less in our lives so that we can have more of you. I pray that whenever we do spiritual disciplines, especially things like fasting, that our fasting would be feasting. We would feast on the word of God. We would spend time in prayer. We would journal or, or create space to listen to you or go to beautiful places. Lord, I pray that all of us who are here, Father, would be touched deeply by your Holy Spirit so that all of these things in life, like food and media and all of these things, Lord, that they would be blessed by you and they would be a blessing to us. Thank you for food. Thank you for alcohol. Thank you for the internet. Thank you for television. Thank you for clothes and for shopping. But never, Father, let those things fill the void in our lives. God, we love you and we pray for your blessing and your joy to ravish us. You love us, we pray, God. Help us know today how much you love us. And Lord, we do love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Some of you say, I've gone to church my whole life and I've never known the love of God. Some of you say, I've never known Christ and I want to know Him today. I always want to give to you and to everybody on the Hour of Power the opportunity to know Christ and to know Him now. I actually just want to pray a prayer. If that's you now, to receive that life into your heart, those watching on television or those here in the church, Lord, we want to follow you. We want to receive your love. We repent of our sin and ask for your forgiveness and thank you that you love us even now just as we are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll have ministering elders here and they'd be happy to pray with you for anything. If you have someone that's sick in your life, if you're just having a down week, if you're having a good day and you just want to tell somebody and you know, no matter who it is, you know, just, the elders are here. They love to pray with you and talk with you, so feel free to come down. Thank you, everyone, for worshiping today. We want you to know that we love you, that you're a family here. And now for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.